Over this wall appeared the upper parts of a forest of huge stone statues, 30 to 75 feet tall. These colossi were the E-I-D-O-L-O-N-S, the Eidolons of the conquering kings of the New Empire, the Ramseses and the Senusurts. In the midst of the city rose the citadel, the White Castle. This was an artificial hill surrounded by 40-foot limestone walls bearing palaces and barracks on its top. Beyond the city, for many miles along the western banks of the Nile, clumps of pyramids pierced the skyline with blunt triangular teeth of buff-colored limestone. In these gigantic tomes lay the pharaohs of the Old Kingdom, already a fading memory in the minds of the teeming swarthy folk of the land of Chem, K-H-E-M. This was a city of many names. In Herodotus' time it was called Mennofer, the Memphis of the Greeks. It was also known as the City of the White Castle and the Abode of the Soul of Ptah. Memphis was as ancient to Herodotus as Herodotus is to us. The business of catering to tourists who had come from afar to view its antique wonders was already well in hand. Now let us go yet farther back in time to the very beginning of the Old Kingdom, about 3000 BC. Mena, king of the south, conquered all of Egypt. At the boundary between the former separate kingdoms of the Upper and Lower Egypt, he built his new capital, Memphis, and surrounded it with a great white wall. This wall was probably made at first of brick with a coating of gypsum plaster. In later times, a wall of stone took its place. Three centuries after Mena, in the reign of King Joser, J-O-S-E-R, lived the first engineer and architect known to us by name. This was Imhotep, who built the first pyramid for his sovereign. Now it goes into just too much tedious detail about this person who may or may not even have existed and may or may not have actually been responsible for the things we're crediting him for. Uh, otherwise, there's no real history of Imhotep and his royal master. A papyrus of Ptolemaic times relates how the kingdom was afflicted by famine for several years because the Nile failed to rise. Josser accordingly took counsel with Imhotep, who explained that Knum, the god of the cataracts, was angry, wroth. Um, so the king deeded lands for temples to the god, and all was well. While there is no reason to think that this story has any historical basis, it provides the kernel of the biblical legend of Joseph in the seven lean years, if you know that one. The king went and said, I had a dream. I had, there, was, there were seven fat cattle and seven lean cattle. What does this mean? And they said, oh, it means you're going to starve for seven years, but then there will be seven good years. And uh, the Bible is just full of crap, you know. Probably Imhotep was a universal genius like Archimedes and Leonardo da Vinci. Such was his repute as a physician, architect, writer, wizard, statesman, and all-round sage that in later times collections of wise sayings circulated under his name. Before King Joser, Egyptian kings and nobles were buried in a tome called a mastaba, M-A-S-T-A-B-A. -A. This was a rectangular structure of brick with inward sloping walls set over an underground chamber. The reason for the inward sloping walls is that most Egyptian buildings of this time was in mud brick. Although mud brick is one of the feeblest of structural materials, the Egyptians learned that if they made their walls taper upward, these walls would not crumble away so quickly. When they began building walls of stone, they continued to taper their walls, just like the silly Greeks did. The Greeks had all kinds of little things on the Parthenon, there were copies in stone of the copies in plaster of uh, old wooden temples. Uh, little teeny things about woodworking that lasted into the plaster age and then into the stone. So they had stone tapered walls in Egypt. Although this uh, was no longer needed. The Egyptians, after the first few dynasties, became the world's most conservative people. So conservative, in fact, that more than 2,000 years later, in Ptolemaic times, they were still tapering stone walls upward. They would not even question it. Uh, and that's sturdier. A tapered stone wall is sturdier. The southernmost of the two pyramids at Dashur was begun as a true pyramid, but about halfway to the top, the angle of inclination of the sides decreases sharply, 
so that the sides appear folded in. So it goes up like this and then bends in, you know, uh, yeah, like that or something. Hence, this pyramid is called the bent or blunted pyramid. The likeliest reason for this odd change of shape is that the king for whom the pyramid was built expired before its completion, and his successor hurried and cheapened the work by finishing it off with a lower top than had been planned. The other pyramid at Deshur, usually credited to King Seneferu, was the first large true pyramid to reach completion. It still stands, huge, silent, and solitary, in the desert near the new road from Cairo to Fayum, as impressive in its isolation as the Great Pyramid on the crowded hill west of Giza. Although the names of the kings who reigned when the Dashur and Maidum pyramids were built are known, it is not certain which king built which tome. Now the king that uh, Herodotus called Cheops, he was the second king of the fourth dynasty, his name was Khufu, built the largest pyramid of all on a hill five miles west of Giza in a town on the west bank of the Nile just above Cairo. Khufu called his masterpiece the Kuit Khufu, or Khufu's Horizon. Although some cultists have denied Khufu's authorship of his monument, there is no doubt about it. Besides the testimony of Manitho and Herodotus, Khufu's name was found in red paint on some of the stones of the interior. This enormous pyramid re measured 756 feet square. It originally rose to a height of about 480 feet, although the uppermost 30 feet are now missing because of the quantities of stone that have been stolen from the outside. The cathedrals of Florence, Milan, St. Peter's at Rome, St. Paul's in London, and Westminster Abbey could all be placed at once in an area the size of its base. The Great Pyramid is made of about 2,300,000 blocks of stone, weighing an average of two and a half tons apiece. Except for the Great Wall of China, it was the largest single human construction in antiquity. Khufu's Great Pyramid is not only the largest of the pyramids, it is also in many ways the best built, despite Kipling's derisive verse, Who shall doubt the secret hid under Cheops' pyramid? Was that the contractor did Cheops out of several millions? The sides of the base come to within seven inches of forming a perfect square. They are also oriented to within less than six minutes of an arc, one-tenth of a degree of the true north, south, east, west directions. And the south side is within two minutes of the true east, west direction. Such accuracy is amazing. None of the other pyramids is oriented so closely, albeit some approach the Great Pyramid in this respect. Like his pre predecessors, Khufu used limestone from local outcrops for the bulk of his pyramid, while for casing he used fine limestone from Troyu and the Makotam Hills east of Cairo. The capstone was probably gilded, Wow! Uh, but nearly all of the fine stone was peeled off by the medieval Muslim rulers of Egypt to build bridges and houses in Cairo. We skip quite a bit. I'm going to talk about the corbelled arch. <clears throat> the corbelled arch and vault were used in Mesopotamia and in Egypt before the invention of the true arch and vault. Corbelling is laying courses or layers of stone or brick so that each course overhangs the one below. So if I have my books here and I corbel them, my first row of books and the second row will go over your third row, be a little for the fourth, fifth, sixth row, and you've got this leaning wall. And then if you come the other way, from you know from the other side, then you've got a pretty sturdy arch, sort of, kind of. It's not a true arch, it's called a corbelled arch. When walls are corbelled out of two sides until they meet, a corbelled arch or vault results, although a structure of this kind is neither so strong nor so roomy as a true arch or vault, it is easy to make and does not require centering, that is the wooden scaffolding shaping to match the inner surface of the arch or vault, which holds up the stones or bricks during construction. Now they had these corbelled, in ancient Greece they had these corbelled um, vaults, and they would just, it was a circle, and they would go in, up, top, and uh, then the, the walls want to sort of buckle out with the weight from the top. They, they're forced outward. Uh, the thing about the arch is it takes all that down, pushes it down towards the ground. But these corbelled ones will buckle outwards, 